All right. So welcome to our Lunch and Learn with Anne-Marie Hagen uh, from Cab Oop, sorry as I go along there from Cabbage Town Dropout to the Ontario College of Art, exploring the unexpected life of artist Frederick Hagen. Um, this webinar is sponsored by the Varley Mackay Art Foundation of Markham and also TD Bank. Um, here at the city of Markham and at the Varley Art Gallery, we like to just begin with a brief land acknowledgement. Um, so we acknowledge uh, the communities in circle, the north, west, south, and eastern directions, the Haudenosaunee, Huron-Wendat, Anishibe, Seneca, Chippewa and the current treaty holders, Mississaugas of the Credits people. We share the responsibility with the caretakers of this land to ensure that the dish is never empty and to restore relationships that are based on peace, friendship, and trust. We are committed to reconciliation, partnership, and enhanced understanding. Um, so before we get started uh, with Anne-Marie's uh, presentation, there's just a few things I'd like to point out for everyone. Um, we will be recording this webinar, uh, just to let everyone know that. There are closed captions available if you are interested. Um, you can enable these by going to the bottom taskbar of the uh, of the Zoom application, and you can turn on or off the, the captioning as needed. Uh, we will also be having a question and answer period near the end of the presentation. Uh, that can also be accessed at the bottom of the Zoom application bar. Uh, if you don't see it there, you may need to click the more button and you will see the Q&A section there. Uh, please feel free to enter your questions at any time during the presentation, and we will have a question and answer period near the end, so we will get to that. Um, but yes, I am pleased to have with me today Anne-Marie Hagen. Um, just a little bit of info about Anne-Marie. Uh, Anne-Marie Hagen is an award-winning curator and museum professional with over 35 years experience. From 1998 to 2014, she was manager of the Museums of Mississauga, shepherding the growth of the museums, including the restorations of the Benares Historic House, Port Credit Log Cabin, and the Leslie Log House. More recently, she was senior curator history at the Peel Art Gallery, um, Museum and Archives in Brampton, her work there included innovative collaborations with local Sikh, Muslim, Black, and Indigenous communities. Anne-Marie has a Bachelor of Arts in History and Women's Studies from the University of Toronto and a Master of Arts in Public History from University of Waterloo. Uh, so without further ado, I would like to turn everything over to Anne-Marie. Perfect. Thank you. I, I just need to share my screen here, which is going to just go perfectly. There it is. Wonderful. So um, everybody can see, I assume, and everything's okay. You let me know otherwise, Ryan. Yes, everything looks good on our end. Okay, thank you. So um, hello, good afternoon, and thank you, Ryan, for that kind introduction and for this chance to speak to you all today about my dad, artist Fred Hagen. Okay, now we're just going to get this there. Okay, some of you might remember that 24 years ago in the year 2000, the Varley Art Gallery hosted a wonderful retrospective of exhibition of Fred's work, One Man's Angle, the work of Frederick Hagen. I know that show meant a great deal to him. And around that time, he also donated some paintings and um, support sketches to the gallery. So I am delighted to be back at the Varley Gallery, if virtually today, um, to talk about my dad's rather unexpected and unpredictable life. Okay, the slide is not there. 
Okay. As you learned in the introduction, my background is as a historian and museum curator rather than as an artist or art curator. And that's an important distinction. It means that I've approached this subject from a historical perspective and of course a personal one too. My understanding of my dad's life obviously begins with being one of his five children. Art and life were, were and are always intertwined in our family. And that was and is mainly a wonderful thing, though it presents some interesting challenges. From the time I was very young, I've been fascinated with my dad's art and his creative process. I really cherish the chances I had to observe him working and later to actually help him curating a traveling show of his work and assisting with historical research on several projects. Now that I'm retired, I love having the time to dig into research to learn more about my dad, particularly his early years. Of course, I always knew the outline of his story, but the details were missing. In the 1930s, in the midst of the Depression, Fred had to quit school after grade 10 and take a factory job to help support his widowed mother and seven siblings. So from that inauspicious start, how is it that he created a vibrant life as a respected Canadian artist, represented in major public collections, teacher at the Ontario College of Art, now known as OCAD U. He was there for 37 years and he created a series of stamps for Canada Post. That all seems rather unlikely somehow. But what I've come to understand and want to share with you today is that some very unique personal and historical factors, as well as important mentors, came together to allow Fred to create the artist's life he had dreamt of since childhood. Um, in terms of the research sources that I'm using, as you might expect, our family holds art, photographs, and papers relating to my father. And um, if I've used those, they're identified on the slide as Hagen Family Collection. Some items such as this etching are in private collections, while many of the images are artworks that are held in public art collections. Anything such as this painting, which is marked Boshi Gallery, um, is available for purchase at um, his dealer, at his gallery in Toronto. And by the way, this is a painting that I just love. It's a great example of how family history and daily life were often wo woven together in my dad's art. Jenny Bell was my maternal grandmother, and this was our kitchen table. That's our kitchen floor when I was growing up in Newmarket. And these days, that table is still in the family. It's in the Toronto kitchen of one of my kids. As far as I know, neither of my parents ever owned a camera, so there are very few of the kind of family photographs that one might expect. But fortunately, my eldest brother Carl was interested in photography and studied it at Ryerson. Over the decades, Carl has created a rich photograph documentation of Fred at work. These are a few of Fred's exhibition catalogs. As well, there are dozens of reviews, interviews, and articles about him that have been published over the years. He's included in important works such as former AGO art curator Dennis Reed's A Concise History of Canadian Painting. Reed wrote that Fred had a quote, highly personal, some would say idiosyncratic artistic vision. And uh, Reed highlighted Fred's significant impacts on the history of Canadian art through his teaching at the Ontario College of Art. Another really important research source is Fred's handwritten unpublished 1989 memoir, which he cryptically titled, No Accounting for Art, an account of 50 years doing, meeting, talking, exhibiting in around Ontario, 1939 to 1989. He wrote this memoir while my, my mom, Isabel, was very ill with cancer. And I think he found it really helpful to deal with that, that sad and difficult time by immersing himself in the memories of the 50 wonderful years he'd had with my mom. In 2000, Fred donated that memoir and many of his papers to the Edward P. Taylor Library and Archives at the Art Gallery of Ontario, or AGO. And I found that collection to be very illuminating in trying to understand his life and work. 
And just in a beautiful bit of serendipity, one of my kids, Al Stanton Hagen, is now an archivist and they work at the AGO in the archives. I know that my dad would be just delighted by that, as am I. So obviously a key of source of understanding Fred as an artist and a man is the vast body of work that he himself created over his lifetime. Here in his works, you find complex stories of his family of origin, his environment, his mentors, experiences, his demons, and his passions. You'll see that Fred worked in a wide variety of styles and mediums, including sketches such as this one of a street dance on a hot summer night in his Toronto neighborhood. He did this sketch when he was 21 years old. And then he took that sketch back to his studio in a garage in the backyard where it inspired this vibrant painting. And you can't really tell here, but it's a big painting. Our family is really thrilled that these two works, which Fred did, as I said, when he was a young man, were recently accepted into the city of Toronto's art collection. He also did so many watercolors, which were usually done outside while he was exploring his surroundings. He did furniture design and built the furniture. Our new market home was filled with, with his furniture. But these days, his five children, eight grandchildren, and two great-grandchildren, we all enjoy bits and pieces of his furniture in our own homes. And another uh, medium is printing using stone lithography. And lithography is really an important art form for Fred. So I will talk about a bit later in detail. He captured an expansive range of subjects and styles in his art. Sometimes his work is just simple and lovely, such as watercolor of flowers that a neighbor brought over for my mom on her birthday in 1972. And sometimes his, his art is dark and haunting, such as Descent. And often his work defies easy definition. Recently, McLaren Arts Centre art curator Rachel Dietering wrote this of Fred. Quote, working in a moment where abstraction has gained increasing popularity, Hagen remained committed to figuration producing portraits of humanity that combined cubist, mannerist, expressionist, and even classical principles of composition, while ultimately creating his own unique style based in his personal existential questioning. So that is kind of an introduction to give you an idea of sort of how and why I've put this story about my dad's life together. And you've had a bit of an intro to his art. So let's go back to his beginning so that we can understand where this all came from. Robert Frederick Hagen was born in Toronto in 1918, the second child of Mary and Arthur Hagen, who lived on Ontario Street in the working class Cabbage Town neighborhood of Toronto. My grandfather Arthur was a carpenter and partner in the business in Ryan and Hagen. And growing up, Fred spent a lot of time at the carpentry shop, helping out and learning about the whole process of woodworking and design. Fred attended Dufferin Public School on Berkeley Street, but he didn't do very well there. I remember him talking to me about his, his time at school and getting a strap every Friday when he's failed the weekly spelling test. But the one thing he did love about school were the field trips. As he wrote in his memoir, and I'm quoting, I had hoped to become an artist since about 10 years of age when I first saw the museum collection at the old normal school, and then the paintings at the art gallery, and I entered a world that I have rarely left. By the time Fred was 13 in 1931, there were eight children in the family and tragedy struck. There was a um, diphtheria outbreak in Toronto and Arthur died at the age of 37. And then soon after the Ryan and Hagen carpentry shop was destroyed in a fire. So Fred's mother, Mary, who was 33, was left to raise her children alone in the midst of the depression. Fred attended Central Tech School for two years of high school. In current affair discussions, he began to learn about world politics, and that helped to plant the seeds of his left-leaning worldviews. 
Central Tech had some amazing teachers there in their artistic program, including A.J. Casson and Doris McCarthy. But once Fred turned 16, he was expected to quit school to help his mom support the family. But by this point, Fred knew he had to become an artist. At home, he'd claimed a small bit of solitude by fixing up a little corner in the cellar in the basement so he could get away from the noise and bustle of the family. From 1934 to 1940, he worked a series of different factory jobs at a box company, a lithograph company, furniture dealer, and a jewelry case company. In 1935, 17-year-old Fred began to take evening drawing classes back at Central Tech, and the instructors were encouraging him, so he started doing sketches and paintings of familiar sites in his neighborhood. And soon, he was also taking life drawing classes at the East Toronto Workers Club. Fred's mother, Mary, so my grandmother, was absolutely scandalized by the results of these life drawing classes because her son was drawing naked women. Oh my goodness. So family lore has it that my grandma actually burned some of his so-called indecent works. But to be fair, I have not come across anywhere where dad actually wrote something confirming that rumor. In 1937, Fred was th thrilled to discover evening classes at the OCA. And as he he wrote, quote, the instructors, John Elfson, Frank Carmichael, the principal, Fred Haynes, they were all very encouraging and they introduced me to myself. These mentors were very important to Fred, particularly given sort of the way his mother and some of his extended fa uh, family originally scoffed at Fred's dreams and taunted him with homophobic slurs about artists. But meanwhile, Fred's curiosity and thirst for knowledge had him reading the daily papers, listening to speakers on street corners and trying to fill in the gaps in his education. Throughout his life, he was always reading widely, philosophers, artists, playwrights, historians, and humorists. These are some of the books that he was buying in the 1930s and the 1940s to, to learn about Western culture and um, I, I really love these books because he always wrote when he the year he bought them in the book and they're like a physical manifestation of how he educated himself. And in fact, are one of the reasons why most people who do my dad would have been surprised to know that he hadn't made it past grade 10 in his formal education. At the same time as becoming an artist, Fred was learning to pay attention to what was happening around him culturally, frequently visiting the Royal Ontario Museum and the AGO. And on a winter evening in 1938, Fred sat in the back row at Massey Hall watching a Russian ballet company perform Giselle. He did a few sketches in the evening and later painted this in his garage studio. I've always loved the color and movement in this painting, the sense of being in the audience alongside a young, my, my dad is a young man who's experiencing his first ballet. And I am lucky enough to have this painting. So it's in my living room and every day it makes my heart happy. Fred was still just 21 when he painted this scene at All Saints Anglican Church in Cabbage Town. And of course, in 1939, the world was on the verge of World War II, something that would have unexpected impacts on Fred's life. In his memoir, Fred wrote, quote, 1939 was a great and important year for me as an artist becoming and as a man growing. Now, part of why 1939 was important to him was that's when he first noticed Isabel Heald, who also attended the Young People's Group at All Saints Church. Though it's interesting that when my mom told the story, she admitted that she'd in fact noticed the shy, handsome young man a whole year before because he'd lifted her down from a hayride on a picnic. But in any case, by the fall of 1939, when Fred was 21 and Isabel, a 16-year-old high school student, they started dating. Fred has written that when he met Isabel, quote, I met the only person who had touched the chords of my heart. He continued, we must not have, we must have been an unusual twosome as several of our acquaintances thought we were not suited to each other and spoke of it. 
Well, despite this, they got married at All Saints on, in June 1943. My mom was just 20 at the time, but she knew herself and she refused to promise to obey her husband, which was what had been expected in the Anglican marriage ceremony. That's something I have always admired about her. She was telling the truth when she said, I'm not going to be someone who obeys. From my perspective as one of their daughters, I see that both my mom and dad were absolutely beautiful, wonderful, warm, loving people. And each could also be quite difficult and immature in their own unique way. They were very, very human, as we all are. So let's return to the other reason that Fred thought 1939 was so pivotal in his life. For the first time, one of his artworks was leaving the country and it was going to be exhibited at the New York World's Fair. As well, this painting, which depicts Fred's father's funeral, was included in the Royal Canadian Academy annual exhibition in Montreal. Fred later wrote, quote, there were moments that I almost had confidence and it was a wonderful support to have reached out to Montreal and New York and into my heart for love of Isabel. My dad was 21 at the start of the war, and of course, like most young Canadian men of his generation, he enlisted to serve, or I should say, he tried to enlist several times. However, he was always rejected. He's written uh, this about his first attempt to enlist. Um, quote, I had tried to enlist in the Air Force as soon as the war was declared, but they had no interest, nor had the Army. The combination of glasses, hernia, and a recent loss of phalanges and a half from the first finger left hand, he lost part of his finger in his factory job, seemed to make me useless to the cause of assuring victory in our time. Since he'd been unable to enlist the fall, in the fall of 1940, Fred decided he was going to go to New York to take courses at the Fabled Art Students League. He'd saved up his money, quit his factory job, and he was ready to go. And his mother's brother, who lived in Chicago, had agreed to sponsor Fred, which was something that was required for his entry to the United States. However, at the last minute, his uncle refused to sign the sponsorship form, so the trip had to be cancelled. Fred was deeply disappointed and found himself unemployed and at loose ends. He decided to visit his father's aunt and uncle who lived at South River, close to Algonquin Park. He stayed there for six weeks alone in a cabin, painting the world around him every day. It was his first real experience of solitude and he loved it. He later wrote, quote, the whole experience was, I think, essential, for I believe that I sorted out a lot of family feelings and came to live with myself with a little more intelligence. While in South River, Fred went to the nearby post office regularly, of course, hoping for letters from Isabel. And yes, he did get some of those. And he also received a letter telling him he was required to report immediately to the basic training camp in Newmarket, Ontario. Fred absolutely hated the experience of the training camp and felt suffocated in the army barracks. And yet his being sent to Newmarket really changed the trajectory of his life in many ways. Many years later, he wrote, quote, I did not know myself very well, for I wanted to join in, be part of the experience of my generation, yet I felt alone, isolated, apart from the whole mechanics of collective activity. Whenever he had free time, Fred would go for walks. He left the army camp. He quote, and I'm quoting here, I walked, rambled a lot in Newmarket, finding it a lovely place to be. I had never really known a quiet town before and the main street, Ferry Lake, tidy streets of comfortable looking homes quieted some of the range that I was manufacturing during the camp exercises. While at the training camp in Newmarket, Fred had an encounter with a fellow artist that was truly life-changing, quote, one day on Main Street, I saw Rudy Renzius recognizing him, for I had seen him demonstrating metalwork at the Canadian National Exhibition. I spoke to him. He was friendly, asking me to drop in to see him at his Pickering College shop. I did the next free evening that I had, and I was much impressed by what I saw. The shop, the tools, the work. 
He then suggested going to his home. What a magnificent experience it was. I met Ingeborg, that's Rudy's wife, enjoyed their coffee, saw more books on art than I had before, and visited them several times to escape the camp life, sitting quietly with a book. At the end of basic training in December 1940, of course, most participants enlisted and were sent overseas. Fred tried to enlist and was turned down again, and he's written of, of this, quote, this time it was also my mental attitude to group activities, end of quote. He returned to Toronto to live at home and to find another factory job. At least he'd be close to Isabel. And of course, he continued to sketch and paint on the streets of Toronto and in his backyard studio. In late June 1941, Fred was trying to decide what to do about a phone call that he's described as altering his life totally. It was a call from the director of YMCA Boys Camp Pinecrest near Bala. The war was, of course, causing serious labor shortages, and the person they had originally hired to be the arts and crafts instructor at the camp had just enlisted, so the director was rather frantic. Fred had been strongly recommended by Rudy Renzius. So my dad asked for a bit of time to think about this, because it was a big decision, and he was told he had one hour to decide. It was an exciting opportunity, but also a difficult decision because Fred liked his factory job at Clapworthy. He was making $23 a week with overtime, the most he'd ever made. And so Fred called Isabel to ask her for her advice, which was to, and I'm quoting my dad, quoting my mom here saying, quote, do what you want to do, end of quote. Fred knew that his own mother would not appreciate him taking this drastic cut in pay, just sort of room and board and an honorarium. But still, Fred made the difficult decision to quit his job and go to Pinecrest. He later wrote, quote, in a few days, I knew I had decided well, for I met several great people. More, I could contribute to the camp life in a real way, being myself. At Pinecrest, Fred met crucial mentors and began really important lifelong friendships. He realized that he was having the opportunity to fill in a lot of the social and educational gaps that he had. Here he was, the inner city kid who had never had the chance to go to camp himself, and he was now thriving at Pinecrest. Although Fred painted this work in the 1970s, it reflects something significant that happened at Pinecrest in the early 1940s that impacted his whole life. He was lying uh, in the sun on his stomach reading a book and an arrow landed that someone had shot in the wrong direction, landed and went into the back of his leg. Um, he described it as hurting like all hell was around me and no one else there was willing to pull out the arrow. So he, they were squeamish, he had to do it. And um, that part of his leg gave him pain for, for the rest of his life. It worsened in the 60s and he saw many doctors and had several surgeries, but nothing really happened. And I really think that, you know, as you go through his writing and his art, um, that pain really did impact his, his life and, and his behavior. It's not easy to live with, with pain that haunts you. Going back to the Fred's first um, summer at Camp Pinecrest, one of the most important and wonderful people that he met that summer was C.R. Blackstock, commonly known as Blackie. And I did notice at the beginning that in fact, um, Blackie's son Richard is here. So that is lovely. Um, and, and this painting in real life is so full of light and color, it's amazing. Um, Blackie was just one of several camp counselors who also taught at Pickering College, which was a private boys school located in Newmarket. And Blackie ended up being my dad's best man. And he and his wife, Nora, were always friends of my parents. But here again, as I mentioned, there's a labor shortage and uh, the, with the war. And in particular, there was a real shortage of teachers. So by the end of Fred's first summer at Camp Pinecrest, Joe McCulley, the principal of Pickering, had offered Fred a job teaching art, and he had done this based on Blackie's and Rudy's recommendations. 
So think about it. Fred had a grade 10 education and three months earlier, he'd been working in a factory and now he's being offered a job at a private boys school. It's rather head spinning. So Fred returned to Toronto to ponder the offer that would take him into a world he couldn't quite imagine. The annual salary was $700 plus room and board and it was less than half of what he had been earning. So his mum thought this was a really bad move. Fred decided to go talk to one of his mentors, um, Fred Brigden, who was a respected landscape artist. And um, Brigden was also a member of the Royal Canadian Academy. He strongly advised Fred to turn down the offer at Pickering. Fred Brigden said that Joe McCulley, um, the principal at Pickering, was, and here I'm quoting from what my dad wrote about, um, about this conversation, that Brigden said that McCulley was, quote, a hot-headed socialist with no good reputation among the people who counted. So walking home after meeting with Brigden, Fred decided he was gonna take the job at Pickering College. And he later wrote, I knew that I could expect no more than I had received from the respectable conventional world of Toronto. I'd given up my hope of reaching the Art Students League, but now I had a chance to live with a group of educators who thought they were progressive and were suspected of being modern. Joe, said he was happy I was coming up to Newmarket, that he had just accepted a number of youngsters from England, war or orphans, they were called, a variety of nationalities. So my dad had ignored the advice of his respected art world mentor, and certainly the advice of his mother, and he had chosen his own path. path. And this decision has lasting repercussions. So, what on earth was this place Pickering College in Newmarket that was supposed to be this hotbed of socialism in the midst of World War II? Well, the college actually dates back to 1842 when it was founded by the Society of Friends, the Quakers. And in 1942, the board of directors had hired Joe McCulley. Joe was an Oxford educated, up and coming educator who had some rather radical ideas in the time. For the time, he really believed in art and the value of art and education. And he also felt it was really important to try to create in the boy, it was a boys school, so that's why he's writing about boys, the desire for education and in having faith in the best of in every boy. In the 1930 Pickering College yearbook, The Voyageur, it was reported that, quote, during the past year, the headmaster has given much thought to the stimulation of interest in Canadian art. The school hosted an exhibition of work by Lauren Harris, a member of the Group of Seven. And in fact, Harris's son, Lauren Harris Jr., was a student at Pickering. In 1932, Joe created a very innovative creative arts department with an advisory committee that included Toronto artists such as Harris, um, Lismer, A.Y. Jackson, and sculptor Frances Loring. I love that there was a woman artist in that group. Four young artists of ability and promise were offered positions as fellows at Pickering, and this the committee helped um, um, Pickering choose those artists. The artists were given room and board in exchange for working in the craft shop, which was a place where the students were always welcome to putter, ask questions, learn, and, and create things. I suspect it was this unique arrangement in the midst of the Depression that led to Fred, Big Fred Brigden's comment about socialism at Pickering. In the fall of 1935, Pickering hired Rudy Renzius, who was a Swedish engineer and an artist craftsman who was now going to run the creative arts department. And it's interesting, Joe wrote something in that year's yearbook, quote, um, quote, artists have been noted since time immemorial for their strangely individualistic tendencies. To say, therefore, that our little band of artists has not added variety to our life would be a denial of all experience. So knowing about this background of art and its importance at Pickering, one begins to understand and how and why Joe McCulley would welcome someone unconventional like Fred to join them. Joe truly valued both um, artists and the works they created and felt that they should play an important role in education. 
Fred would go on to teach at Pickering College for five years and it changed his life. He helped out with the younger boys, ran the arts and craft shop, as well as designing stage stat sets for Pickering's chapel, such as this one, um, dr drama productions, and their wonderful annual Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Fred softened his rough edges, learning to survive in a private school atmosphere where he was expected to teach the younger boys good table manners. As he later wrote, quote, I had the Pickering experience where I had managed to exist in a mainly university oriented background for five years, but that was a very tolerant ground to accept me when I was a stranger to its customs. Meanwhile, of course, the war was continuing with daily impacts on everyone's lives. In 1942, three of Fred's brothers enlisted, Pete, Jim, and Jack. I love this photograph. Um, of that, this whole family. I think it's the only one. It's taken in the backyard of the family home in Ontario Street in Cabbage Town. And of course, that's my dad in the front row beside his sisters. His dress and pose certainly capture how deliberately out of step he was with his family and with the war effort. However, he continued to capture the impact of the war on the home front in his art. These work include this 1942 painting of a hectic scene at the Bay Street bus terminal in Toronto. Fred's three enlisted brothers are in the foreground and Fred painted himself into the background in the brown coat with his back turned away, again, out of step. This work was accepted into an Ontario Society of Artists traveling exhibit and wonderfully, all three of my brothers, of his brothers who enlisted were shown here survived the war and they all lived to ripe old ages. The last one um, who's shown here on the right, that's my uncle Jim, he didn't have his uniform yet. He was also an artist and he passed away at the age of 99 in 2022. While at Pickering, Fred continued his walks around Newmarket, sketching outdoors and using the arts and craft shop at the school as his studio and workshop. He and Isabel became engaged in 1942, and Fred began to dig deeper into his interest in stone lithography. In 1942, Fred found out that there was an old stone lithograph press available from Will Alexander, um, who had a, a commercial press shop on Spadina Avenue. He um, was thrilled that dad wanted um, to buy this. He was also thrilled that dad was teaching at Pickering. He liked Pickering and Macaulay. Anyway, it cost $75 to buy the press stones and ongoing free advice. And Fred had $75 in the bank that he was supposed to use to buy a new suit for his upcoming wedding. Instead, he got a lithograph press and got married in his old suit. I think that tells you that my mom knew what she was getting into. Fred's desire to explore this different and at time uncommon approach to making art was all encompassing. Lithography was so central to his lifetime of teaching and making art that I wanna just explain a little bit about it and then we'll go back to Fred's life. In a very simple way, it, stone lithography is the process of creating art by drawing on a very smooth stone, applying ink, carefully placing placing the paper on top and using a lithograph press to transfer the image from the stone to the paper. It's a very meticulous and difficult process. And when more than one color is being used, each color needs to be drawn, inked and printed separately. Over the course of his lifetime, Fred created and printed over 500 distinct lithographs. Growing up, I did not realize it was weird to have a lithograph press in your basement. And I did like to spend time quietly observing him at work. And the, the smell of the ink is, is something that really conjures up those memories. In the 1940s, Fred was a member of the Canadian Society of Graphic Artists and with his skill and reputation as an artist and lithographer growing. His work was regularly accepted into the Graphic Artists um, and Ontario Society of Artists annual exhibits, and he was seen as a real pioneer in stone lithography. So year after year, he was invited to do demonstrations at the Art Gallery of Toronto, now the AGO. Fred and Isabel married in 1943, and their first child, Carl, was born late the next year. 
At Pickering College, they were among many other young married couples starting families, and it was sort of wonderful small town um, life in Newmarket. I think from Pickering's perspective, they would have been happy if Fred had stayed at Pickering for his whole career, but that was not to be. World War II came to an end in 1945, and veterans were returning to Canada, often with funding to pursue higher education. So places like the Ontario College of Art were facing double their usual attendance and a shortage of instructors. So in 1946, Fred Haynes, the principal of OCA, offered Fred a full-time teaching position. Now remember, Fred has, he'd taken night classes at OCA, never been a full-time student there, hadn't graduated from anywhere. But Fred Haynes clearly saw Fred Hagen's potential as a teacher and an artist, reinforced, of course, by his experiences at Pickering, because it's hard to imagine they would have hired him without the, those years teaching. When Joe McCulley received Fred's letter of resignation, he was surprised and responded immediately, asking to meet with him. He was very disappointed to lose Fred, and he valued him greatly, but he did understand the potential of this opportunity. And despite his disappointment losing Fred at Pickering, he showed that he was an extraordinary mentor. He gave Fred two extra weeks off at Easter break and a personal check for that he wrote for $100 for Fred to use towards a trip to finally take classes at the Art Students League in New York. And thanks to Joe, Fred made it to New York this time. It was just six weeks, but it was a transformative experience. He um, took uh, classes in uh, George Miller's lithography print shop. He visited as many galleries as he could and took evening classes at the Art Students League in lithography. As he wrote about it much later, um, quote, my God, I thought as I left the Frick Art Museum, is this really real and happening to me? And it was. So in the fall of 1946, Fred began teaching full time at the Ontario College of Art. He'd learned so much there at Pickering and he painted daisies and summer fields as a sort of farewell to the rural setting of the school. And he did continue to do set designs and be involved there actually for the rest of his life in different ways. And this painting, I remember um, talking to my dad about it when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old and telling him how much I loved it because of the basket and the daisies. But I questioned him, it's like, why did you have to put like the cow poop there, dad? And he laughed, uh, my dad's laugh, the beautiful laugh. And he explained that you can't have the daisies without the cow shit and that's just life. So. It, it helped me in understanding the, that lesson in life and also in looking at his art. So by Sorry. the time he's 30, dad's teaching at OCA. And as this letter shows, the National Gallery of Canada has started to collect his artwork. And I've always known the kind of bare bones of this story, but now that I've gone back, I can see how it all sort of came together and realized how important his mentors were. And I also can't help but wonder how different my dad's life might have been had he been able to enlist and served with the Canadian military, or if he'd turned down the chance to go to um, teach arts and crafts at Pinecrest, or if he'd followed Fred Big Brigden's advice to avoid those socialists at Pickering College. Instead, he carved his own unique path, which took him to teaching at OCA. Fred helped the school um, acquire a lithograph press and establish the first lithography print shop in a post-secondary institution in Canada. From 1948 onwards, he taught lithography there, and by 1955, he was head of the print, new printmaking department. That lithography shop is still running today at Okadju, and it's named after my dad. Sorry, Anne-Marie. Yeah. Uh, I don't mean to, to interrupt you there, but you wanted me to give you a little heads up uh, when it was about quarter past one. Yeah. So I just wanted to give you a little okay. heads up there. I will wrap up quickly. Oh, no worries. Thank yeah. you. Okay. I, want, I just want some time for questions, but thanks. Yeah, of course. So he carried a full-time teaching load at OCA and um, as curator Dennis Reed has written, Fred produced quote, 
quote, a remarkable quantity of highly original figurative work in watercolors, oils, and lithography, in spite of a heavy teaching load that was effectively extended by the long daily commute to Newmarket, where he continued to live and maintain a studio. See, most of my dad's colleagues, artists, they had their studios and lived in Toronto. It was unusual that dad drove home to his wife and kids in Newmarket every day. The recognition of Fred's unique explorations of lithography continued, and in 1950, he was the only Canadian whose work was represented in the first international biennial of contemporary color lithography in Cincinnati, and he was there for many years. In 1955, suddenly, Fred and two of his OCA colleagues um, and dear friends, uh, Eric Freefield and Harley Parker, were finding themselves being rejected by some of the Canadian and Ontario Art Association jury shows. So they decided as young upstarts to have their own exhibit. And it's a remarkable sign of Joe McCulley's faith in Fred and his belief in the importance of art that he agreed to host his controversial exhibit at Pickering College. And there were some letters to the editors in the pa Toronto papers about these upstarts. And, you know, that certainly contributed to my dad's reputation as a renegade. And, you know, Fred Brigden's in the Royal Canadian Academy and suspicious of dad. So when there was talk in the early 50s of dad maybe becoming a member of the Academy, um, my father was excited and disappointed when the nomination didn't move forward. Meanwhile, at home, my mom was always a very practical, common sense partner, partner for my dad. She took on the responsibilities for the household finances, raising the five of us, and she was always the hostess with the mostest, warmly welcoming guests to our home. My mom was sociable, smart, and funny, and very good at helping my dad smooth over some of his social anxieties. Through the 1960s, Fred continued to sort out his feelings about his life and himself through his art. His complex painting, Dundas Street Haunts, explores his journey from Dundas Street East in Cabbage Town, where he grew up, to the Dundas West world of OCA and the AGO. That last painting and then the next one were major studio works that Fred completed in the basement studio of our family home in Lundy's Lane in Newmarket. And um, my dad was always interested in history and we had a family visit to the Sharon Temple in the early 1970s. And afterwards he asked me to help him with his research. I was like 11, um, but I went to the Newmarket Public Library to get some books as requested on, on the rebel rebellion leader, William Lyon Mackenzie, except I came back with books on the Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King. So they're related, but two different people. So I had the wrong guy. Dad explained it and laughed and sent me back to the library to get the right books. So this is uh, my dad and my brother Kurt carrying that same painting to load it into the van um, for his first big solo retrospective um, in 1978 at the Grimsby Public Library called Hagen, the Mind and the Hand. It traveled to many galleries and, you know, dad didn't give a damn about the establishment and he had little time and talent for marketing himself or schmoozing with the right people, but this, this exhibit was sort of the beginning of recognition um, in a wider way. After 37 years, Fred retired from OCA in 1983, and much of that decade was taken up with a commission from Canada Post to create 16 postage stamps commemorating the exploration of Canada. I was so lucky. I worked with him, helping him with his research and later curating a circulating exhibit about the stamps and also he developed a lithograph portfolio, 55 lithographs on related topics. Um, I wish I had time to get into all that today, but they're kind of deserving of their own separate presentation. Fred received um, the Canadian Centennial uh, Medal in 1967. And then um, in uh, 1998, he received the Royal Canadian Medal, um, which is the highest medal the RCA can give to someone who's not a member. We remember Fred Brigden probably stopped him from becoming a member. And, uh, but now that the old guard had passed on, they wrote to him and offered him membership. So it's, a, you know, it's into the 1980s and 
my dad's response to them was short, but not very sweet. He replied that when membership would have helped his career as a young artist, the Academy refused him. And he didn't like the fact that now that he was old and accomplished, they wanted him. So basically in the letter, he told them to fuck off. So given all that, I think it's kind of amazing that, you know, um, they did give him their highest honor uh, in a wonderful ceremony in Quebec City. When my dad died in 2003 at the age of 85, he was lauded in the obituary in the Globe and Mail with the heading, he painted what he believed in. And you know, it's a simple statement that sums things up and I think he would have liked it had he still been around to see that. And in the obituary, they wrote, Mr. Hagen was immune to artistic fashions. His fierce dedication to his personal vision meant that he was never easy to classify. And that difficulty in classifying Fred's art is one of the reasons he's so interesting and remarkable, but it's also one of the reasons he didn't see more commercial or critical success. He was always true to himself and was uncompromising, and sometimes he was difficult. 20 years after his death, interest in my dad's work continues from both private collectors and public collections. Um, there was a great exhibit in the Old Town Hall Gallery in Newmarket in 2017. And last year, um, an exhibit and catalog produced by the McLaren Arts Centre in Barrie. Um, the Boshi Gallery in Toronto is his dealer and continues to represent him. It's great. The town of, of Newmarket named a street after him, Fred Hagen Court and Cabbage Town Historical Society to put a, a nice plaque in front of the house he grew up in. And the city of Toronto has created Hagen Lane. So those are really lovely ways in which he's remembered. Shortly before he died in 2003, my dad was reflecting on life, his life, and he told me, hey, I've had a good run. He was 85. And he said that, you know, he still remembered his very fir first visit to the art gallery and how it first felt to dream that maybe one day he could be an artist and that he could have works hanging in a gallery like that. Remarkably, he made that dream come true. And just as I wrap up, I want to share this because it is, I got to say personally, it's my favorite photo of my dad. This is us on the front veranda of our home on Lundy's Lane and my twins, Al and Gemma, we're just five months old here. And I just love the way he's interacting with them. And, you know, when my dad died in 2003, my kids who are his youngest grandchildren were 10. So that means all of his grandchildren have many wonderful memories of him. This final image is of a remarkable painting that is in the collection of the Varley Art Gallery and is currently on display in their summer solstice exhibit. On Saturday, August 10th, you can join Markham, um, gallery curator Anique Glode um, and I for the curator's gallery because we're going to explore this get in depth into this signature painting of Fred's that he actually considered for decades before he finally painted it. So thank you so much for the chance to share some of my dad's story. If you have any questions I'm happy to answer them or if any of you have your own Fred stories please please share with us. Thank you. So I will stop my screen sharing. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That was a Thank wonderful you. presentation. Um, I do see that we have some questions here. Um, so I guess I'll read out the question and I'll let you uh, do the answering. Do my best there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, our first question, does Anne-Marie remember watching her father work? What does she remember most about watching his practice develop? Yes, I mean, I think as you could tell from my talk, I, I, I it was something, you know, uh, whenever we went to a friend's cottage or anywhere out, he was always out working and, and sometimes I'd go along. I really remember watching him work on lithographs. Um, and the work is, is required great concentration. I knew if I was down there, I needed to be quiet. And I, I knew after he had done the printing, it was as he lifted the paper off the stone, he's looking to see, has it come together the way he wanted it to? And when he did, he would always like, just let out a joyful noise and you'd know, yes. If it didn't, it would be a different kind of noise he would make. And 
I was a smart enough kid to know I'm just going to quietly go back upstairs right now because he'd be really mad at himself and very immersed in that. So, yeah, I, I didn't, I found him very approachable um, when he was in the right mood, but there were also times you're going to leave him alone doing his stuff. And, and I would just add to that, uh, doing, helping him with the research on the stamp project oh, was really an amazing experience. That was really fun. That was really fun. Great. Thank you so much. Um, our next question for you, how did your father's work and artistic vision influence you personally and professionally? Ah, that's an interesting question. Um, I personally have like zero artistic talent. I'm not saying I'm not creative. I just like, don't ask me, I don't have that kind of visual artistic talent. But because I grew up in a family going to museums and art galleries and historic houses, I, I really loved that world, but I didn't want to be in the art world where every day I'm Fred Hagen's daughter. That didn't appeal to me. So I kind of went to the adjacent field of museums and studied history, women's studies, and, and went into museums and sort of more artifact stories. So um, I even once early in my career had a chance to work on a project at the AGO, and it was a great project. And I just said, no. <laughs> so, so it has influenced my career. I took other paths. Great. Um, our next question for you, did he have any unique routines or practices when creating his art? Oof. That, that's, that's, that's difficult. Certainly one of the things was needing quiet, solitude, space, and time alone. That was, that was one factor. Um, so I know that he was thinking and he was writing and he was sketching sort of all the time. Um, so, so that's one of the things that, that he tried to do and we've continued is like when a painting goes to an art gallery that they're also getting the sketches that he did working towards it because watching that artistic process is, is so revealing. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers the question. Uh, but, but certainly his need to withdraw from everyone to have solitude at times in his own world to work was an important part of what he did. Okay, great. Um, through your next question, are there any pieces that were particularly meaningful to him or to your family? Mm. Probably every single member of the family would pick a different piece that has most meaning to them. Um, but I think homage, um, there was, if you remember early in my presentation, um, there were a couple photographs of him working on a, a really large painting. He was back after his retirement at OCA and, and um, working with some students and was given space where he could have a huge canvas. He'd always wanted to put a huge canvas in the living room and my mother hadn't been all that keen on, a, you know, this huge canvas taking over the house. So, so he was happy to do that at OCA. And I think that painting really, he was really trying to capture the influences in his life. And that's now in the um, Art Gallery of Sudbury collection and they have the studies for that. And I think because while he was working on that painting, he was actually living um, with me in Toronto because I lived like a, you know, a couple miles away from, from the art gallery. And he would stay with us, sleep, sleep with us, but get up, be walk to OCA, work there all day, and then come back and have dinner with us and tell us about the painting. So for me, that painting is... It's beautiful, I, I really, for me. I think um, I just briefly shared some of his furniture. His furniture pieces are, are 
all of us have some of his furniture and um, there's a cradle that he made when Carl was born that all of his children and grandchildren um, slept in and have their names carved and name and date carved in it. So maybe, again, I every, every one of us would have different answers, um, but, but those are my answers. Perfect. Um, did he have any particular themes or subjects he was uh, he was drawn to repeatedly? Hmm. Um, stones, rocks, like Northern Ontario, the rocks, lithograph stones, like part of what drew him to it was the working with these big, heavy stones that have ground down to be smooth. Um, I that that's definitely a theme and i i think another really big theme is is him trying to figure himself out him trying to make sense of who he is and what matters to him and and so you know you sort of see that his early works of his you know early toronto works of a young artist capturing that versus you know these really complex figurative works um where he's he's sort of trying to figure out the meaning of life, I think. Um, I mean, there's a whole series of work in the 50s on the on the crucifixion, a whole series of trying to understand the crucifixion and that meaning. So and descent is is connected to that. So so those are some of the themes that you find. And then he, he just he loved water and sky and you know, traveling and working in, in Northern Ontario um, really drew him. Awesome. Um, did he keep sketchbooks or journals to record his thoughts and ideas? He didn't use sketchbooks as much as loose paper for his, his sketches. And then he, he would keep those. And um, he... He wrote a, a lot of his sort of day-to-day -day journaling over the years was on like three ring lined paper that sometimes it would have a date, sometimes it wouldn't. And so in addition to his memoir that I mentioned, there's all these jottings and they are at the Art Gallery of Ontario archives. Often they're undated. Um, so you're, you're like jumping from one thing to another, but he, he was always, yeah, he was always capturing things and he would have a little notepad that he would write things. Um, sometimes people, you know, like the the painting in All Saints Church, uh, he, he was always sketching, like even in church, people would think that's pretty rude, um, but he, he was sketching wherever he went. Great. Um, we had someone who I guess it was more of a, a statement than a question, but someone thanking you very much for this presentation. Um, we have a, a question um, actually from our director here at the Varley. Was the feud, um, feud in quotation marks, uh, in the 1950s purely about aesthetics? And was his work too radical? Well, that's such a great question. And I don't have a fulsome answer to that because I'm sort of just in the process of finding out more about that. Um, I found the clippings about it um, at in the AGO archives and like I knew nothing about this controversy. Um, and then I talked to my brother Carl about it, who who is knows a, has is a very good um, he, he he's he's a caregiver um, uh, of my dad's legacy um, in in so many wonderful ways. And he had a copy of the program that had been something my grandmother had. So so we're. I need to do more research. It's it's an area I'd like to learn more about, see if I can see if there's some other newspaper coverage of it. But I think they were seen as working in, in subject areas that um, were maybe more 
more challenging to the more conventional um, artist societies. But um, but I'm, I'm going to say someday I will have a better answer to that question because I want to know more about that too. And also yeah. I've been, one of my things I want to do is approach the Royal Canadian Academy to see if they've got a file on my dad because I would be really interested in seeing that. Yeah, that, that would be pretty cool. Yeah. Um, our next question, what do you think was his most important work or body of work? I don't know how to answer that. Um, because there are things like, you know, the stamp project and then his, like the lithograph portfolio that works with the themes of the exploration stamp project is remarkable you know the latter series and descent and his study of the crucifixion and, and its meaning in in our lives is is remarkable um his, so I, i'm i'm gonna tell you i don't i can't answer that i i okay. um i can't answer that i i, I do just the fact that his work is so different, you know, yeah. you take an early Toronto lovely street scene and put that next to Descent and you're, you're going, is this the same guy? You know, yeah. um, I find that interesting. Okay, great. Um, and then we had just one, one last kind of question statement, someone saying uh, how proud, how proud your dad would be to, to hear you present so beautifully about his life. Uh, and his work. Um, so with that being said, uh, I just wanted to, to thank you very much for this wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm just going to very briefly, just because I don't want to keep everyone here too, too long, um, just briefly share my screen again. Um, where did it go? There it is. Um, just to, um, as you alluded to before, just to promote your your um, upcoming uh, event here at the the Varley. Uh, so our curators' corner, discovering art together, on Saturday, August tenth, from two to four o'clock. Uh, just to let everyone know that it is free and registration is not required. Um, but discover Canadian artistry at an in-person gallery talk. You'll gain unique perspectives uh, with Anne-Marie and also uh, you will be able to join a guided exhibition tour led by our curator, Anik Lode, uh, while exploring the significance of, uh, of Fred's piece, Boy in the Wilderness. Uh, light refreshments will be served uh, and you can discuss the art with your fellow enthusiasts. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to, to highlight your upcoming event, uh, but thank you very much. That presentation was wonderful. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to thank you and thank you to everyone who joined us today. Mm -hmm. um, this webinar has now concluded, so I hope that everyone enjoys the rest of their afternoon and we look forward to seeing you at the, the Varley Art Gallery soon. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye. Take care.